We have to remember the context of 67. We're in the middle of the Cold War. The U.S., and particularly the Pentagon, the strategic planners, are looking for strategic allies, they're looking for partners, they're looking for agents, if you will, to be the cat's paw of their interests around the world. The 67 war happens, lightning fast victory by Israel. The mythology is over six Arab states. It's not really true, only three of them actually fought. But okay, it was a big victory very fast. The Pentagon looks at it and says, we could do business with these guys. Business being one of the operative terms here, because we very quickly see the beginning of what has been since then a permanent collaboration between both U.S. and Israeli arms manufacturers and the militaries themselves, the Pentagon and the IDF. So that collaboration in the context of the Cold War becomes very powerful, very fast at the time of the 67 war. The result, very soon, is that throughout the world where the U.S. is involved in these proxy wars in the context of the, so of the anti-Soviet efforts of the Cold War, you see Israeli arms, Israeli military trainers, not only in the Middle East, certainly there, but also in places as far afield as Mozambique, Angola, uh, uh, El Salvador, Nicaragua, South Africa, all around the world, Israel emerges as a cat's paw of U.S. military goals in the Cold War. In that context, the pro-Israel lobbies, which had been around for decades by that time, but had never really had that much influence, suddenly they're as influential as could be, and they're claiming it. And it's this idea, you know, if there's a train moving forward and you get behind the train and push the train, you could say, wow, I'm really good. I pushed that train all the way the way I wanted it to go. We didn't hear very much about the fact that the reason the pro-Israel lobby appeared so strong was that it was pushing policy and policy makers in the direction they suddenly wanted to go anyway. So that led to a huge level of intersection between the role of the lobbies and the role of the strategic policy makers in convincing the public Israel is our guy, Israel's the only democracy, Israelis are like us, the thread of the undercurrent of racism runs right through it, where the assumption is we can have relations with Arab countries, but at the end of the day, they're really Arabs. They're not like us. Israelis are like us. You put aside the fact that half of them are us, half of them come from Brooklyn, but aside from that, you have a scenario where the assumption is, and the f assumption turns out to be false, but nobody talks about that, that all Israelis are white. Now, it's true that the vast majority of Israeli diplomats and high-ranking officials, certainly in that period and on for many years after, were in fact white. They're Jews like me, uh, you know, European Jews. In fact, the majority of Israeli Jews uh, have not been a majority European for many, many years. The majority are Arab, Turkish, Persian Jews. And as well, there's a small constituency of Ethiopian Jews. But the racism element comes in right from the beginning in convincing Americans that the Israelis are like us and therefore this relationship is special. What made it so powerful was precisely that integration process between the interests of the lobbies, the political interests, the interest in influencing popular culture, etc., and the strategic interests of the Pentagon and others to make sure that Israel was on board the U.S. side in the Cold War. So in many ways, at least in 67, the debate about who's the dog and who's the tail, I always thought was a kind of silly debate. It's about the intersection between them that made it so powerful and indeed so dangerous. The impact of the novel and particularly the movie Exodus, I think would be hard to overstate in transforming public opinion about uh, what Israel was about, what its creation was about, its relationship to the Holocaust. So you had handsome Ari ben Kanan, played by Paul Newman, you know, the beautiful blonde American shiksa, uh, played by, as I recall, Eva Marie Saint, I think. And then you had this amazing cast, and it's, it's shot in Greece, I think, or somewhere. It's beautiful, Mediterranean, and everybody, except the refugees, who don't really look emaciated the way you sort of figure Holocaust refugees should, but okay. But all the Israelis, are tanned and fit and they're wearing short shorts and sandals and they're all very tough and strong. The women are liberated, the men are handsome. It's a narrative that shapes, I think, everything about how people in the U.S. for a generation saw 
what Israel represented. I know in my Sunday school classes, I grew up Reformed Judaism, that meant we didn't talk about God very much, it was all about Israel. And we talked about socialism, we talked about the kibbutz movement. The, it wasn't the kind of Zionism that sort of said we should get rid of the Palestinians, they just didn't enter into the equation. They just were not a player. There was nobody in this land. It was the land without a people for the people without a land. And you have Golda Meir shortly after that making her famous statement that there is no Palestinian people, they do not exist. And those things not only went without challenge, they were absorbed into the popular culture and indeed I would say the academic culture. I think textbooks uh, reflected a great deal of that, newspaper coverage reflected it, television, uh, and as well as you know movies and that sort of thing. So it was set as a theatrical piece almost that here you had a heroic, small country made up of refugees of the worst violence that had ever occurred in history, taking over their historic homeland. And there were a few people in the way. We have to get rid of them. But they weren't the part of the story that had any bearing on what people thought about Israel. 